Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Easy Baked Beef Brisket. That's right, not only is this apple and onion smothered beef brisket delicious and easy, it's also very fast. Although when it comes to brisket, very fast is a relative term, and this still takes like four hours. But above and beyond cooking this in like half the usual amount of time, the great thing about this method is it actually produces a brisket that is tender and still moist. All right, there's a lot of things I'll wait eight to 10 hours for, but dry beef is not one of them. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by seasoning up our brisket, which I'm gonna do very generously on both sides with a mixture of kosher salt, freshly ground black pepper, and a little cayenne. And by the way, the three pound piece of beef brisket you're looking at is actually only half of a whole brisket with this half being the flatter, leaner side. And if you're buying brisket in your average supermarket, this is almost always the piece you're gonna get. But having said that, if you do use the other half, or even a whole brisket, this technique will still work nicely. And generally these things are sold fairly well trimmed, but just in case yours wasn't, you'll wanna trim it down so there's no more than about a quarter inch layer of fat. But anyway, like I said, we will season that very generously, at which point we could go ahead and start the recipe. But what I highly recommend is popping this in the fridge overnight to let those seasonings really sink in. And to aid in that effort, what I like to do is roll up a couple pieces of foil to create sort of a makeshift rack for the plate. And what that'll do is raise that brisket up off the surface and allow some airflow underneath, as well as make a space for any moisture drawn out by the salt to drip down. So that is optional, but it only takes a second, and I think it does help. But either way, we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge uncovered for about eight to 12 hours. And then once that's set, we can move on to the only other thing we have to prep. And that would be our onion and apple mixture, which will eventually turn into our gravy. And we'll start that by sauteing some onions in butter over medium heat, along with a nice big pinch of salt. And of course, if you are making this for Passover, using that butter would not be kosher. So if that matters, you can go with some vegetable oil, or better yet, some schmaltz, also known as chicken fat. But anyway, what we're gonna do is cook that stirring on medium heat until those onions soften up and turn translucent. And if you wanted, you could cook these until they were nicely browned and caramelized, but I'm not going to, because I'm adding apple juice to this, which is kind of sweet. So I'm gonna keep these a little bit on the savory side. And like I said, just cook them until they turn soft and translucent. Of course, having said that, you go ahead and do them as long as you want. I mean, you are after all the Leonard Cohen of how far these onions should be going. And your sauce will have a little deeper color if you go longer. But as I mentioned, cooking them just to this point, I think will pair better with the apple juice. And by the way, in the business, this is referred to as sweating the onions. And then what we'll do once we think these have cooked long enough is go ahead and toss in some sliced garlic, as well as a little touch of freshly and finely chopped rosemary. And then we'll finish up with one cup of apple juice. And we'll go ahead and stir all that together, as well as raise our heat to high. Because before we use this, we want to reduce these liquids by about half. Oh, and please relax if you're not a great judge of what half of something is. Because if you didn't reduce this at all, it would still work. Or if you reduced all the liquid, it would still work. So just relax and let it boil for a couple minutes until you think maybe sort of half of the liquid is gone. At which point we will turn off the heat because that is now ready to use. And that's it. Once our onion mixture is set, we can go ahead and pull our beef out of the fridge. And because our meat was salted and uncovered, it's going to look a little darker and the surface will look kind of leathery. But don't worry, it's supposed to look like that. And then what we'll do to get this ready for the oven is transfer half of our apple onion mixture into a baking dish. And as you can see, I do like to place a sheet pan underneath, which I think makes this easier to move around and will catch drips, not to mention possibly providing some heat diffusion. Although I'm not sure if that last one has any effect. But anyway, we'll go ahead and place our meat on top fat side up, and then we'll transfer the rest of our mixture over the top. Oh, and if possible, Try to choose a pan or baking dish that's just a little bigger than the brisket itself. Although anything oven safe will work. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and wrap that very tightly in foil. At which point it is ready to transfer into the center of a 325 degree oven, but only for an hour and a half. All right, this fast method for cooking brisket requires two temperatures. So we're gonna start at 325, but after an hour and a half, we're gonna turn it down to 250. And we'll continue at 250 for about two hours and 15 minutes, or until our brisket looks like this. Well, not this, but like this. And if everything's gone according to plan, our beef should be fork tender, which mine was. In fact, mine might've gone about 15 minutes longer than I needed, 
Which reminds me to tell you, it's probably not a bad idea to check yours after two hours at 250. But anyway, once our meat is tender, we'll go ahead and scrape those onions off the top into our cooking liquid. And we will carefully transfer that meat to a plate. And we'll use that foil we just pulled off to keep it warm. While we go ahead and finish our amazing apple onion gravy. And to do that, all we need to do is pour it into some kind of container. Because we are going to have a significant amount of rendered fat. And by pouring it into something like this, we can easily skim that off the top. At which point, if we want, it's ready to use in this form. Which is very delicious, and would not look bad at all. But if we want to quickly and easily turn this into a gravy, all we need to do is blend it for a few seconds. And by the way, if you fill yours to the top like I did, be sure to pulse it on and off for just like a second at a time. Because if you turn it on and leave it on, this is what's going to happen. So that was unfortunate. But these things will happen. And I simply cleaned it up and kept blending, as if nothing had even happened. And by simply blending those cooking liquids, we've produced quite a gorgeous sauce that tastes even better than it looks. And of course, you'll give it a taste for seasoning, but I bet it's very close. And that's it, once our apple and onion gravy's ready, we can go ahead and slice our meat, which you always wanna do across the grain, which for me are going this way, so I'll have to slice across that way. But I'm gonna turn this around, cause I have my eye on this beautiful succulent looking end, and I will slice some off so I can go in for a taste. And even though we used a relatively short cooking time, this meat was beautifully tender, and more importantly, still very moist. All right, if you really know what you're doing, those low and slow methods can work out and produce something similar to this, but it can be a little trickier. Plus, if it's about the same, why are we waiting six extra hours? That is a good question. Another good question is why am I eating this on a cutting board and not next to a mashed potato pancake and carrot salad with my meat being sauced with that amazing apple and onion gravy? that we may want to garnish with some finely snipped chives. And yes, that is kind of a big pile of beef. But one taste, and you'll understand why I needed that much. And above and beyond the moist, tender meat this method produces, that subtle earthy sweetness from our onion and apple mixture has really permeated that brisket and somehow makes things taste even beefier. And in case you're wondering, as delicious as that gravy is on the beef, it also worked amazingly well on my mashed potato pancake, which I'm pretty sure we have a video for. But if we don't, I will take care of that at some point. In fact, as great as the beef and sauce was, I have to admit to being sort of distracted by that pancake. Although to balance things, I was not at all distracted by the carrot salad. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling easy baked beef brisket. Even though it's technically braised. But that aside, this method is much faster and produces results just as good, if not better, than the classic low and slow method. Plus, once we're done cooking, we're able to produce one of the easiest and most delicious gravies ever. So whether you plan on leaving out the butter and making this for Passover, or maybe you plan on making this for that friend of yours who's very proud of their beef brisket, which takes like 12 hours, and you've never had the heart to tell them it's a little bit dry, or you're just in the mood for moist, tender beef brisket, but don't want to spend all day waiting for it to cook. Either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Pulled pork using SFQ, the original San Francisco style barbecue sauce. We're going to take a three and a half pound pork shoulder. Usually has the shoulder blade in there called a blade roast. Just make sure you're getting pork shoulder, also known as pork butt. You're going to take your SFQ dry rub, or whatever dry rub you have, and sprinkle it generously on all sides. How many sides? I didn't count, but make sure you get them all. Then you're going to pop it in a Dutch oven, something that has a tight-fitting lid. Then, because I don't have a smoker on hand, I'm going to do this little trick that I like. I'm going to take two ramekins, put a quarter teaspoon of liquid smoke, and a half a cup of water in each. And then I'm simply going to place those on either side of the pork shoulder in my Dutch oven. And then we're going to roast that so slowly. And that little bit of smoke is going to kind of permeate. And the water is going to keep a nice, moist, very humid cooking environment. which really goes a long way to making a super delectable, succulent, juicy pork shoulder. All right, it's going to go in the oven at 210 degrees. I know, it's not much. 210 degrees, very slow. 
for 12 hours. So make sure you time this right. You don't want to be waking up at, you know, 3 in the morning to take this out. So 12 hours later, we took it out and look how unbelievably tender. That shoulder blade bone just comes right out. You really just barely have to touch it. It just collapses. See that? You notice I'm wearing sanitized gloves, so I have to wash my hands. All right, you're not going to see much fat, which is good because most of it just melted out. But any pieces, you know, if you get a clump there, see that? You could take that out. Or you could just chop it all together. Up to you. All right, once we have our pork collapsed, you're going to take a cleaver or a knife and give it a rough chop. Now, this is personal preference. Some people like their pulled pork chunky in large pieces. I understand. Other people chop this until it's almost like a puree. That's just going too far. All right, I kind of like it somewhere in the middle. Once you chop it, you will garnish with some warmed SFQ barbecue sauce or the barbecue sauce of your choice. Something of lesser quality is fine. Now, what you want to do here is you want to taste and season because the inside of the meat was not brined or injected with a marinade. You want to taste for salt and pepper. I gave mine just a little pinch of salt, a little pinch of pepper, and then we're ready to serve it up on traditional white buns. Now, please, do your patriotic American duty and do not use nutritious, fiber-rich whole wheat buns. This should go on the cheapest, lightest, airiest white bread bun you can find, okay? So if you have to wear a disguise to the grocery store, do it. We're going to add a little sauce to moisten the bun. Pile up your succulent, moist, juicy pork. A little more sauce. Unbelievable. Look at that beauty. I want to eat that. In fact, I did eat it. And in the background, there it is. Your SFQ. As I play with the focus on my new high-def camera. See how the back is in focus and the front's not? And... The front wasn't focused and the back wasn't. And with that, I apologize to all real photographers out there that just, you know, rolled their eyes. And if you received your SFQ barbecue sauce as your holiday donation thank you gift, that's just one idea you can do with it. Anyway, I hope you give that a try. Check out the site for more details and the ingredients, although there's not really ingredients. And as always, enjoy. barbecued chicken and I'm sure you've been sitting around thinking I wonder how Chef John does barbecue chicken well here's my method for getting delicious barbecue chicken without that black burnt skin so I have a chicken a whole chicken that was cut in half or you can do it yourself or you know buy it that way I'm gonna make some deep slashes a couple in the breast a couple in the thigh one on the leg now what those slashes are gonna do is allow the marinade and barbecue sauce to permeate the bird all right, I'm also going to cut the wing right there at that first joint just to make it grill easier. Don't throw those away. We'll grill those later. All right, in a bowl, I have crushed garlic, a quarter cup of rice vinegar, and then a few tablespoons of barbecue sauce. Now, what you're going to do in this very simple marinade, again, it's just the barbecue sauce, a little vinegar, rice vinegar, which has got a nice, sweet, salty flavor, and garlic, of course. We're going to swish around our slashed chicken. All right, once it's all coated, you're going to leave it slash side down and just refrigerate that for one hour. That'll give you time to, you know, build the fire and do the other stuff. After the hour, you want to pat it dry. We don't want it wet. So I just use a few paper towels here. All right, so once it's patted dry, we're going to dust it with a very basic barbecue dry rub, which, of course, I will have the ingredients for on the website. Why, why would I keep that a secret? So go to the website, foodwishes.com, and you'll get those ingredients. All right, out to our already hot grill. Now here's the secret to my barbecue chicken. I'm just going to mark the skin side for like, I don't know, three, four minutes. Just get those nice black grill marks, that nice char look. I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to cook it the entire rest of the way that direction. That way I can keep brushing on my barbecue sauce every, I don't know, six seven minutes and build up a beautiful thick barbecue sauce layer without burning it because if you cook this with the lid down it will cook all the way through and probably i don't know i'm going to guess about 35 minutes depends on the size of your chicken all right you, you can tell when your chicken's done right you can use a thermometer if you want 170. so i'm going to close the lid i'm going to close the vents so it's just barely open 
and that's going to kind of smoke and bake, and you don't need to turn it again. People turn it, and the barbecue sauce, that beautiful, glistening, lacquered layer of barbecue sauce they built up, just incinerates in like four seconds. What a waste. Okay? So a little black around the edges is fine. Some black grill marks is fine. But you don't want the whole chicken to be black. So keep painting on the barbecue sauce, closing the lid, let it cook for another six or seven minutes. By the way, see the wings I put on there? That's my snack. Mm, time for a wing break. Okay, so about 35 minutes later, my chicken was done. I'm going to take it off. I'm going to go inside. And you know what? I'm going to eat. So that's my method for barbecue chicken. Very simple process. You slash it. You marinate it. You dry it off. You grill it, but only for a few minutes on that one side with the skin. So it looks beautiful like that. Then flip it over, paint on the sauce, and just basically roast it in your barbecue. So go to the site, get all the ingredients. There's only a few, but I'll show you what was in that dry rub. And as always, enjoy. Rusty Chicken! That's right! With a name like Rusty Chicken, you know it's going to be good. And why exactly is it called Rusty Chicken besides the color of the finished chicken and the marinade? I'm not at liberty to say. But for now, I'm just going to show you how to make this incredibly simple and highly effective grilled chicken marinade. So we're going to start with a mortar and pestle. I'm going to add some sliced garlic, some red chilies. Now I'm using that Calabrian chili paste I love. You can also use sambal or just finely minced hot chilies. And to the hot stuff, we're going to add some sweet stuff. In this case, maple syrup. I know, kind of a surprise, but trust me, this totally works. I'm also going to add some soy sauce, some mayonnaise. I know you're skeptical, but hang with me. And finally, a big splash of rice vinegar. And that's it for marinade ingredients. So we're going to get a firm grip on our pestle, and we're going to start pounding and mixing this. By the way, quick tip, always smash your garlic first and then add your liquids. It mixes so much easier. This took me an extra three minutes because of that mistake. And it's for a marinade, so that really is not a big deal. But you know what? We should always be using the right techniques. All right, once all those ingredients are mashed and mixed together, we're going to set that aside while we get our chicken ready, which is so easy, because we're using boneless, skinless chicken thighs. My favorite kind of chicken for grilling. I enjoy breasts, don't get me wrong, but as far as something that's going to stand up to an assertive marinade and a smoky char grilling and stay moist and tender and awesome, chicken thighs are way better than breasts generally. And having said that, of course breasts will work, so just relax. I said you could use breasts. All right, I'm going to place those in a shallow baking dish. I'm going to pour in the marinade, and I'm going to give those a thorough, thorough mixing until I'm very confident every single crack, crevice, nook, and cranny is completely coated with that rusty marinade. And then we're going to wrap that and let it marinate. you got some options. You could throw it in the fridge for a few hours. This is not really a recipe that requires a long marination period. A couple hours is fine refrigerated. Or what I do, I just marinate this for a half hour on my countertop, not refrigerated, while I build my fire. And because these are going to go right on the grill, it doesn't matter. It's not going to go bad. So anyway, mine stayed on the countertop about 35 minutes while I started my coals and got my grill beautifully preheated. All right, once your grill is ready, we're going to go ahead and peel that plastic off. Now, you may want to re-season these with a little bit of salt. That's usually what I do. I'm assuming with a recipe like this, you're going to tweak it to your own strange and unusual desires. All right, but I'm going to add a little bit of salt here. I'm not going to wipe any of the marinade off, by the way. I'm going to place them on the grill just like that. And the last tip here, place them smooth side down. That smooth side will sear onto the grill much better than the rough side, which could stick. And you might tear your chicken. So I always start on the smooth side. I give it about three minutes to form those grill marks. Turn it over. I'm going to cook it on that side for about five minutes. And then I like to just move them around and play with them till they're done. Like most grilled meats, I will try to angle the thickest part of the meat towards the hottest part of the flame, if possible. And I like to turn them three or four times so the juices kind of caramelize on the both sides, giving it that beautiful, beautiful rustification. Look at that. So I can't really give you time. Mine took about, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes over a hot fire. But you can go by temperature, you can go by time. The beauty of chicken thighs, you don't have to take them off at that precise moment like breast. Chicken breasts go from juicy to dry in like a couple minutes. Chicken thighs, not so much. So generally, we're going for a nice rusty browned surface, even more so than we're trying to get the perfect doneness. So even though yours might be cooked, if they don't have that nice brown surface on them yet, leave them on another minute. It's fine. And at that point, I deemed mine completely done and perfect. 
I took him off. I brought him into the house. I let him rest for five minutes while you get your side dishes together. But since I didn't have any side dishes to put together yet, I just basically stared at these for five minutes. They were so beautiful. I could not divert my eyes. In fact, my wife walked in. She's like, what are you doing? I said, staring at the chicken. Anyway, five minutes later, it was ready. It was rested. I surrounded it with some little lime wedges, which I think go great with this. And that was super delicious. How delicious? I decided to start eating it with no side dishes or plate to put it on. And you can see here, as I cut this with a fork, that's right, it's fork tender. It's just so perfect and juicy and flavorful. No one flavor dominates. It's just an overall gorgeous way to grill chicken. So that's one reason I don't give it a name that has ingredients in it. I don't want people thinking it's going to taste like soy or honey or whatever. I just want people to know it's going to be delicious, it's going to be easy, and it's definitely going to be rusty. So I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Chinese barbecue pork. That's right, I'm very excited to show you my take on Chinese barbecue pork. Or Sharsu if you want to save a few characters on Twitter. Or is it Sarshu? Sarsu or Sarshu? I'm probably saying them both wrong. But regardless of what you call it, this stuff is very delicious, and as you can see, extremely shiny. And as you may have heard me say before, people love shiny food. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by putting together our Chinese barbecue sauce. And that's going to involve adding the following ingredients to a saucepan. And we'll go ahead and start with some hoisin sauce, which like me isn't very attractive, but it is effective. And then we're also gonna dump in some ketchup, which if I'm not mistaken is actually a Chinese invention. And then we're definitely gonna need a whole bunch of soy sauce, as well as some brown sugar. And I'm using light brown sugar here, but the dark will work. And then for a little extra sweetness, we'll also add some honey. And if that looked kind of runny, that's because I had to heat the jar to get it out. I always feel like I have to explain that stuff because people will email me saying, hey, that doesn't look like honey. But anyway, let's continue by adding a little bit of Chinese wine, either rice wine or plum wine. And if you can't find that, you could use sake, which is what I'm using, or I hear even some dry sherry will work. And then we'll also toss in a few cloves of crushed garlic. And then as far as seasonings go, we're gonna go ahead and add a spoon of Chinese five spice, which is one of the signature flavors in this, as well as some freshly ground black pepper and a little touch of cayenne for good luck. And then last but not least, one very optional ingredient, a very tiny amount of pink salt. And no, that's not Himalayan pink salt. This is actually the pink curing salt I made you buy for the ham video. And I'm gonna talk about that on the blog, but it is optional. And then what we'll do is take this to the stove and place it over medium high heat. And we will whisk that all together. And then all we're gonna do here is let this come up to a boil and let it cook for exactly one minute. And believe it or not, that's it. As soon as that mixture is boiled for about 60 seconds, we'll simply turn it off and maybe give it a stir. And then all we have to do before we can use that is let it cool down to room temp. And while we're waiting for that, what we'll do is go ahead and prep our pork. And while you can pretty much use any part of the pig for this recipe, my favorite option would be a big old piece of pork shoulder. Pork loin is also very popular, but for me it's a little too lean. Okay, as you can see, the shoulder has a good amount of fat, which means we're gonna be able to barbecue it for a lot longer without it drying out. So that is my recommendation, but of course that's up to you. You are the Tyron Lu of your Chinese barbecue. And as far as prep goes here, I'm simply gonna to attempt to cut this three pound roast into four equal size pieces. So I'm gonna split it in half lengthwise like this, and then I'll cut each of those halves in half. And as usual, if there's any natural separation, we will use that to help us guide our cut. And for me, this is kind of an ideal size, since we're cutting this small enough to get lots of surface area, but not so small where we're gonna risk the meat drying out. But of course, having said that, it really doesn't matter as long as your pieces are consistently sized and will cook at the same rate, you can go ahead and cut that any way you want. And then what we'll do once our pork is prepped is go ahead and combine it with our sauce, assuming of course it's cooled down to room temp. But before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and add one more very special, very secret ingredient, a spoon of red food coloring. Oh yeah, it's just not for red velvet cake anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and add one spoon of this very optional red food coloring which is gonna help give our pork that signature mahogany color. Oh, and if you're wondering if red food coloring is safe, I'm really not sure, but I assume so. And then what we'll do once that's mixed in is go ahead and transfer in our pork and toss them around until they're thoroughly coated. Always, of course, being conscious of any nooks and crannies that may not have any sauce in them. And for something like this, it's usually not a bad idea to transfer it into a zip top bag. 
but I happen to have room in my fridge, so I'm going to leave it in this bowl. So we'll go ahead and combine our pork with our sauce, which I guess technically right now is a marinade. And I'll cover that with a piece of plastic. And then what we're going to do is let that marinade in the fridge from anywhere between 4 and 12 hours. And while I'm generally not into long marination times, this is one recipe I think you should let sit overnight, which is exactly what I did. And then the next day we can go ahead and pull that out of the marinade, sort of wiping off the excess as I transfer it onto this pan. And speaking of excess, we're definitely going to save all that extra sauce for future glazing purposes. And then even though our marinade had a good amount of soy and hoisin, I do like to fairly generously salt the surface before this goes on the grill. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to sprinkle each side with some kosher salt. And then once our pork has been properly panned up and seasoned, I'm going to head out back and throw this on the grill. And by the way, if you're going to use a grill for this, it has to be over indirect heat. As you may be able to see, the ceramic grill I use has this sort of heat diffuser, which protects the meat. But if you don't have one of these type of grills, I'm going to give you all the options on the blog post, including how to do it in the oven, which actually comes out quite nicely. So we'll go ahead and place our pork down over indirect heat, and we'll go ahead and cook this covered, adjusting our vents to maintain a temperature somewhere between 275 and 300. All right, closer to 275 is better. And we will barbecue this pork for a couple hours until it's beautifully caramelized, and ideally reach an internal temperature of between 185 and 190. And what I'll usually do is place it down and leave it on for about 45 minutes or so before flipping them over. And then once I have those turned over, I'll go ahead and give them a brushing with our sauce, which we don't have to boil before we brush on, since this sauce is going to be cooked on. But if you're planning on brushing some of this on the cooked meat, which we are, you definitely want to boil it first. And I'll remind you of that later. But for now, let's go ahead and brush it on, and we will continue that same process of letting it cook, maybe giving them a turn, brushing on some more sauce, until, like I said, we've reached an internal temperature of about 185 to 190, which for me took about two and a half hours. Oh, and by the way, just so there's no confusion, if you're used to barbecuing your pork shoulder until it's soft and succulent and falling apart, this is not that. All right, the final product here is going to be way closer to like a ham or a roast pork than it would be to like a pulled pork. So just something to keep in mind. But anyway, like I said, I cooked mine for about two and a half hours to an internal temp of about 185. And if everything's gone according to plan, it should look something like this. Okay, ideally it's fully caramelized and absolutely gorgeous. And we'll go ahead and pull it off the grill and head inside, where it looks like the color changed, but it didn't. That's just my suspect lighting skills. And then if we want, before we transfer this onto our serving platter, we can go ahead and glaze this hot meat one last time. But as I mentioned earlier, if we're gonna use this sauce on the cooked meat, we have to have boiled it first. Otherwise, you might be looking at a stomach ache or even a lawsuit. But anyway, I glazed that up with some more sanitized sauce before transferring it onto a platter that I garnished with some grilled green onions since our coals were already hot. And that's it. What I assume is my totally unauthentic take on Chinese barbecue pork is done. And I could look at that all day. But a better idea would be to slice it up and go in for a taste. And thanks to that little pinch of curing salt and our secret optional ingredient of red food coloring, this stuff should look very close to what you see in your friendly neighborhood Chinese takeout place. So I'm going to go ahead and slice this up and see how I did. And while this is truly a beautiful style of barbecued pork, I find the taste and texture just as impressive. All right, just a great balance between the sweetness and the saltiness, with both of those being elevated by the smokiness. Plus that little hint of exotic aromatic spice in the background, just absolutely gorgeous looking and tasting. And of course what to serve this with or on is so obvious I won't even go into it. Okay, any way you'd serve any other kind of barbecued pork or ham will work here. Although, having said that, I'm going to take out with a little bit of a tease. Since when and if I master the steam bun, I'm going to show you that video, because that is by far my favorite way to enjoy this. Okay, you pile a few of those slices on a steam bun, and drizzle over some hot Chinese mustard, and maybe some chopped green onion. And that, my friends, is just an incredibly amazing bite of food. But anyway, that's it. My method for doing Chinese barbecue pork. Not only is this insanely delicious and pretty easy to produce, it may also bring you some luck. Since in China, the color red symbolizes prosperity and communism, but mostly prosperity. So for those reasons and more, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Salt and pepper spare ribs. That's right, they say whoever makes the most delicious thing using the fewest number of ingredients wins. 
which was the idea that inspired these amazing ribs. And I know I'm not completely impartial, but I think I might have won, as these ribs really were absolutely incredible. Plus, this has to be the easiest method I've ever shared for doing ribs. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by mixing up our salt and pepper rub, which is basically just gonna be salt and pepper, although we are gonna use three different kinds of pepper, which would be some freshly ground black pepper, some freshly ground white pepper, which I always thought should be called tan pepper, and then of course we're gonna add some cayenne. And then last but not least, a little touch of garlic powder, which is not a salt or a pepper, but it is really good in a spice rub for ribs. And that's it, we'll go ahead and give that a quick mix. And our salt and pepper rub is done. And by the way, we call these things rubs, but as you'll see, they're really actually sprinkles. And then once that's set, the only other thing we need to do is stir together a little bit of Dijon mustard with a couple tablespoons of white distilled vinegar. And what we'll do is brush this over our ribs so that our salt and pepper rub sticks on a little better. And also that little touch of acidity will help balance the fattiness of the pork. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and place one big beautiful slab of St. Louis style pork ribs down on a foil lined baking sheet. And we'll go ahead and flip that over and start with the underside. And some people like to pull off that membrane that covers the ribs, but I don't. Although I do like to make some very shallow slashes wherever it's exposed, as well as give it the old polka polka with the tip of the knife, which is gonna help all our seasonings penetrate deeper inside. And then once that's been properly pierced, including under that little meat flap, we'll go ahead and paint over our vinegar mustard mixture. And then once that's been covered with about half of the mixture, we'll go ahead and sprinkle over about 40% of our salt and pepper rub, which like I said, we really don't rub, we always sprinkle, since that's gonna give you a much more even coating. And yes, of course you could do a couple slabs of those smaller baby back ribs instead. I mean, you guys are after all the LeBron James of your salt and pepper rib games. But personally, my vote is to use the St. Louis style ribs, which I think work really well here. And that's it, once just about half of that mixture's been applied, we'll go ahead and flip this over and repeat that exact same process on this side. And the reason I said to only do about 40% of that salt and pepper mixture on the bottom is because I think we want a little more on this side, which is the meatier side. But we're not gonna quite use all the remaining 60%, since I generally like to reserve a teaspoon or two in case we wanna do a little bit of seasoning after these are cooked. And if we don't end up using it, we could just save it to use for our coleslaw and or potato salad. But anyway, we'll go ahead and paint and salt and pepper this side. And then what we should do, time permitting, is transfer this into the fridge uncovered for about four hours or so. Or if you want, you could even go overnight. And that's gonna give that salt and pepper enough time to work its way into the meat. And you will definitely end up with a juicier, more flavorful product. But if you have to cook it right away, go ahead. It will still come out really good. And then once we are ready to go, we're gonna cook these using the easiest rib method ever invented. We are simply gonna place these into the center of a 300 degree oven for about three hours or until tender. That's it. No start high, finish low, or start low, finish high, or wrapping and unwrapping and rewrapping. We are just gonna simply cook these until they're done. But one quick thing I do like to do is about halfway through, pull them out and give them a quick basting with the accumulated juices. Okay, so after about an hour and a half, you should have a decent puddle of rendered pork fat, which we'll go ahead and brush over the top. And don't worry about the other side, it's fine. And that's it, after that brief basting, we will pop that back in for another hour and a half, or until perfectly tender, and hopefully looking a little something like this. Oh yeah. And by the way, when I say perfectly tender, I do not mean falling off the bone. Okay, how we test these is with the tip of a knife, which should slide into that meat with almost no pressure. Okay, we definitely want that meat to come very cleanly off the bone once we bite it. But if that meat is falling and collapsing off the bone when we cut it, it's overcooked. And then what we'll do at this point is let it rest for about 15 minutes before we cut them. And while they sit, we might as well give them one more base with those beautiful accumulated juices. And that's it, once these have rested, we'll go ahead and slice them up. And while these are incredibly flavorful on their own, I went ahead and paired mine with our famous all-American barbecue sauce, which of course we have a video for, which you've hopefully already seen. And since that sauce is a sweet and tangy Kansas City style, it is the perfect complement to these intensely flavored pepper spice ribs. So I slathered some on. And that, my friends, despite featuring only a couple ingredients, were some of the best ribs I've tasted in a very long time. Okay, this recipe was a great reminder to me of just how delicious pork ribs are when we don't try to do too much to them. And I'm as guilty as anyone, making these with marinades and rubs that have like 20 ingredients. But the fairly minimalist approach here really was an eye opener and taste bud opener. Oh, and not to brag, but you can see just how clean that meat comes off the bone when you bite. 
That is a perfectly cooked rib. And I think as far as service goes, just serving them right off the cutting board with your sauce or sauces nearby is perfectly acceptable. But as you might know, I'm contractually obligated to take some pictures. So I went ahead and plated some up and squeezed over some more of our all-American barbecue sauce, which is called that because all Americans love it. And after taking a few too many pictures, I proceeded to enjoy these. And I know I already said it a few times, but let me say it one more time. These really were amazing. Oh, and just because I did mine in a 300 degree oven, doesn't mean you can't do yours over indirect heat in your covered charcoal or gas grill. Okay, it should work out just about the same. Which reminds me, I'm not saying all those overly complicated fussy rib recipes are wrong, but what I am saying is a lot of that might be unnecessary. Since all we did here is put these in the oven, and other than a quick basting, all we did is let these slowly roast until tender, and yet they're still very moist and juicy, and not dry at all. So not only did our simple ingredient list pay off, but our very simple cooking method did as well, which is why I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grilled garlic and herb shrimp. That's right, don't let the generic name fool you. This is one of the finest grilled seafood recipes in all the land. And since we just showed you how to plant your own herb garden, I thought we'd post a video that really illustrates how awesome it is to have those fresh herbs around. So let's go ahead and get started with the marinade, where we'll be using four of those herbs. We're gonna go with some basil, some oregano, and I have two kinds, Greek and Italian. And we're also gonna do some Italian parsley and some lemon thyme. Oh man, is that stuff good on grilled seafood. And above and beyond the fresh herbs and garlic, one of the real secrets to this recipe is to use a mortar and pestle to make the marinade. And I'll go into detail about this amazing tool on the blog, but for now, let's just go ahead and prep these herbs for processing. And all that's gonna entail is taking the leaves off the stems, which is very easy for everything other than the thyme, which does take a minute or two to strip those little leaves off. And yes, when you first start your career as a prep cook in a kitchen, picking thyme leaves is one of the first jobs they give you because everybody hates to do it. But it really isn't that bad, and when you taste these, the effort will be well worth it. So we'll go ahead and we'll pick our herbs, at which point we can move on to making the rest of this mixture. So first up into the mortar, we're gonna place some kosher salt, followed by just a little bit of lemon zest, and then more than a little sliced garlic. That was about three cloves. And what we'll do before we add our herbs is give this a little crushing first. So we'll grab the pestle and we'll give this the old smasha smasha. And we don't really need to go too fine. We just wanna get this started. So go ahead and pound that until you have something that looks like this. And at this point we can add in our herbs, but not like this. Very critical, we're gonna have to cut them up a little bit first. Just start with the biggest basil leaves and kind of use those to wad everything together. And once we have a nice tight package, we can take a sharp knife and slice across this way, and then the other way, and we'll give that a little chop. And it may seem a little odd that we're chopping this before crushing it, but it only takes a couple seconds and really does work a lot better. So we will add in our herbs and we will give that a crushing. And I'm not gonna stop the camera here, but at home, all that herb you see flying out, you're gonna wanna put back in. And I believe I mentioned earlier that the mortar and pestle is kinda key here, and it really is. While you can get something that looks similar to this with a food processor or a blender, you'll just never be able to achieve the same flavor. So in other words, if you wanna crush this, you have to crush this. But anyway, we're gonna crush those herbs into that garlic mixture until we have something pretty fine. I mean, we're not going for a total paste here, but basically something that looks like this, at which point we can add the last ingredient, the olive oil. But we're not gonna add all of it. We're just gonna start with a drizzle and we'll mix that in first before adding the rest. And the reason is when you're working with a mortar and pestle, the rule of thumb is the thicker the mixture, the easier it is to crush. So we'll just start with a little splash and we'll grind all that together for about a minute. And once it's been crushed to about this point, we can stop and add in the rest. And as you can see, I'm also switching to the freakishly small wooden spoon. And basically we're just adding in enough oil to achieve the proper thickness, which I think should be right about here. And believe it or not, that's it. Our garlic and herb marinade is done. So we'll set that aside while we go ahead and grab our shrimp. And what we have here is a couple pounds of peeled and deveined 1620s, which are the size I'm recommending here. And all 1620 means is that's how many come to a pound. So in my opinion for this recipe, the bigger the shrimp, the better. And at this point, we wanna coat our shrimp with our herb mixture, but not all of it. We only wanna add in two thirds at this point. We must save a third to finish the dish with. So we just wanna transfer in about two thirds of that mixture. And then we'll grab a spoonula or something similar 
and give this a very, very thorough mixing. All right, shrimp are famous for their nooks and crannies. So you really do want to make sure you get in there and get in there good until these are all perfectly coated. And then once that's set, what we'll do is we'll transfer that into a plastic bag because we want to let these marinate in the fridge for at least a couple hours. And of course, you want to transfer this in carefully so you don't spill anything. Whoops. But anyway, we'll transfer that into a zip top bag and transfer that into the fridge for three hours. And what if you go for a little less or a little more? It'll probably be fine. And we will also wrap up that last third of that marinade because we're going to need that for later. Of course, plastic wrap does not stick to wood, which is why I like to steal those little shower caps from hotels and motels and use that instead. But that's another video. So like I said, we're going to let our shrimp marinate for about three hours, at which point those are ready to skewer. And I will be using the metal ones for these, but some soaked bamboo skewers will also work. And we will use the standard once through the small part, once through the big part method, which is pretty basic. I would be lying if I said skewering shrimp was hard. And I'm going to do four of these, because apparently I only have four skewers. But don't worry, I'll cook those later. So our shrimp have been skewered, and at this point they're ready to cook. And I highly recommend you do that on a very, very hot charcoal grill. What about gas grills? Not a big fan. But anything hot will work. And the reason I want a very, very hot fire is because I'm going for some serious caramelization. Oh, I've never met a grill mark I didn't like. So a lot of grilled shrimp recipes recommend medium heat, but that is not me. I want very intense heat, very close to the shrimp. But anyway, I cooked those for a few minutes per side until they were just barely cooked through and looking awesome, at which point we'll pull those off the grill. And if everything's gone according to plan, you should be looking at one of the most beautiful platters of grilled shrimp you've ever seen. And at this point, we're ready to serve, but wait, we have one last step to do. We have to take that third of the herb mixture we saved and use that to make a quick sauce to go over the top. So let's go ahead and transfer the rest of that mixture into a mixing bowl, to which we'll add some red pepper flakes. I'm using Aleppo pepper, but just red chili flakes will work. I'm also going to give it a little pinch of cayenne. You know that's good for you. As well as some freshly squeezed lemon juice. And one last drizzle of olive oil. Then we'll take a whisk and we'll give that a mix. And in just a few short seconds, you're going to be looking at a very gorgeous and incredibly delicious sauce to finish our shrimp with. So let's go ahead and spoon that over our shrimp which as you can see have been transferred to a more geometrically appropriate platter. And we will spoon that over. And seriously, how good does that look? And then we finish these off with a few wedges of lemon. And right as I did, the light from the setting sun started being filtered through our neighbor's windblown tree, which caused the light to flicker, which when it comes to photography is a huge problem. But when it comes to everything else, the opposite of that. So I just went with it. And instead of being annoyed, I decided to enjoy it. So I went in for the official taste. And these really were magnificent. Just such a perfect combination with that sweet, caramelized, smoky shrimp, that fresh, aromatic brightness of the herb, and of course, a big punch of garlic. And obviously, if you want to use some different herbs, go ahead. So things like dill or tarragon would also be beautiful in this. But of course, that's up to you. You are the peaches of your herbs. So use whatever you like. But anyway, that's it. Grilled garlic and herb shrimp. So delicious, so simple, so easy especially if you have all those herbs growing for free in your backyard, all right? So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Korean barbecued rack of lamb. That's right, before cows and pigs got involved, America's earliest forms of barbecue featured lamb. And back then, barbecue simply meant wrapping meat in leaves and then cooking it in or near a fire, which is pretty much exactly what we're going to do here. Except instead of using leaves, we're going to use a very simple, incredibly delicious Korean-inspired marinade. So with apologies to those that were hoping for leaves, let's go ahead and get started. And we'll do that by adding a couple tablespoons of Korean chili paste to this bowl. And if you want to use the proper name, this stuff's called gochujang. And what this is is a fermented rice and chili paste. And it is, for lack of a better term, a flavor bomb. And by the way, in the blog post, I'll tell you where to find some. And then to that, we will add a whole bunch of finely minced garlic, as well as some finely sliced green onions. And mostly we're using the white and lighter green parts. And then we'll also want to toss in a spoon of brown sugar. Actually, let's make it a spoon and a half. We're also going to want to pour in some rice vinegar, as well as a little drizzle of sesame oil. And if it seems like I'm not measuring these things very carefully, that's because I'm not, at all. But anyway, continuing on, of course, we're going to need to add some salt, which we're going to do with both regular soy sauce and no low sodium, please. We're going to need all that sodium, as well as a spoon of good old-fashioned kosher salt. 
And then once we have all that in there, we'll take a whisk and give it a mix. And as soon as everything's been thoroughly combined, our marinade, which by the way is also a brine and a sauce, is done. And what we'll do is simply set that aside while we move on to prep our racks of lamb. Which should be pretty easy since these things are generally sold already trimmed. And the ones I bought were. And by the way, these go just about a pound each. And one rack will generally feed two hungry people. And it's pretty key that we're using racks that have been Frenched. Which means the meat and fat around and between the bones has been trimmed out. And if it hasn't been, no big deal. You can just stick your knife in between the two bones and trim that away. And then besides making sure the bones are cleaned off, there's also about an inch thick cap of fat that come on these, which will usually have been removed if you buy these trimmed, which again is how these were purchased. But if you do want to trim a little more off where the bone meets the loin, feel free. And then the last little bit of knife work we want to do here before this hits the marinade is take our knife and cut in between each bone, almost but not quite until it hits the loin. All right, so we're just cutting in between those rib bones and not touching that tubular piece of meat below. And not only will this let our marinade penetrate a little better, but once these racks are on the grill, it's also going to make them cook a little more evenly as well. So I went ahead and did that to both racks, or as you Game of Thrones fans might refer to it, dos raques. But anyway, once our racks are trimmed, we'll go ahead and transfer those into a zip top bag. And then we can carefully and confidently transfer in our marinade. But before we seal this up, we want to make sure we give it a very, very, very thorough massaging. All right, I'm going to edit this down to just a few seconds, but you're going to want to take a couple minutes and make sure you work all that marinade in and around the meat into every single nook and cranny. Oh yeah, don't forget the crannies. And by the way, I've never done this where one of the sharp pieces of bone doesn't penetrate the bag and some of the marinade will leak out, which is why I highly suggest placing this in a bowl. And what we'll do once those are thoroughly coated and this is sealed up is go ahead and transfer that into the fridge anywhere between 8 and 24 hours. And it's usually not a bad idea to give that bag a flip once or twice while it's in the fridge. But anyway, we'll go ahead and let that lamb marinate overnight, at which point we'll pull it out and transfer it onto this plate. And of course you're going to save any of the extra marinade. Just stick whatever's left in the bag in the fridge, and I'll show you what to do with that later. And then all we're going to do to prep these for the grill is blot off a little of that extra moisture from the surface with a paper towel. And by the way, we're just doing this to the fattier side. Speaking of which, once we have that dried off a little bit, I'm also going to apply a little extra kosher salt to this side, and suggest you probably do the same. And then once our racks have been seasoned, we'll head outside, where hopefully we're going to cook these over some nice smoky coals, so that we can legitimately call this barbecue. And what we'll do is want to start these with the fat side down, for about seven or eight minutes before flipping them over. And I should mention, we don't really want to do these over super high heat. Okay, I adjusted my vents so I was maintaining a heat of about 350. And at that temperature, these are going to take roughly between 20 and 25 minutes, depending on the size. And of course, how well done you want them. All right, I'm shooting for about 125 internal temp, which is going to get me just to about medium rare. And like I said earlier, I like to give the fat side about seven or eight minutes before flipping these over. And we'll go ahead and cook them the rest of the way just like that, which is probably going to take another 12 to 15 minutes. But again, it depends on many variables, which is why you're going to use a thermometer to check your work. And if one of your racks is a little bit smaller, like this one here, it's probably going to finish a little bit earlier. So I pulled that one off first and gave the other one a couple minutes. And I should mention, fair warning, the smell is incredible. So if you don't invite your neighbors, there could be problems. Although if you do invite your neighbors, there could also be problems. I guess it depends on your neighbors. And then what we'll do once we've decided our meat's cooked long enough is head inside and let it rest for about 10 minutes. And what we can do while we're waiting is go ahead and transfer any of the excess marinade into a pan and bring it up to a boil so that it's safe to use as a sauce when we serve our meat. And above and beyond bringing it up to a boil for safety reasons, we of course also may want to reduce it a little to thicken it up, which is exactly what I did. At which point we can pull it off and go ahead and brush it onto our racks. Which as you can see we're presenting Flintstone style. With our two sets of bones interwoven and crisscrossed. Which I think makes for a very exciting visual. Especially once glazed. Okay so this step is optional. And you don't have to do it if you don't want. I mean you are after all the John Ham of your rack of lamb. But personally I think it looks amazing. And you'd have to be a madman not to do it. I mean come on look at that. That's almost not fair. I mean, I could seriously look at that all day. But I'd rather cut into it and try some. And to carve this, we simply cut between the bones, normally allowing two ribs per piece, 
since there's usually eight bones, but this one had an extra one. And not only did our marinade serve as a marinade and as a glaze slash sauce, but because of its sugar and salt content, it also acted sort of as a brine. And it really helps that meat retain a lot of moisture, as hopefully you can see here. And sure, it helps we didn't overcook it, but this could not have come out any juicier. And by the way, if you overcook yours just a hair and it's not quite as pink as you want, don't worry, just paint some of the sauce on and no one will ever know. Because with this marinade, even a little bit overcooked, it's still going to be very juicy, very succulent, and extremely flavorful. And I would have been more than happy to eat the rest of that rack just like that. But I thought I would be a professional and plate some up for the final shot with a little bit of our famous prop coleslaw. And while our Korean style marinade did amazing things texture wise, the flavor and savoriness of this is just as impressive. So to summarize, there is nothing I don't like about this marinade. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling Korean barbecued rack of lamb, while certainly not as popular as pork and beef, when you consider its richer, slightly gamier flavor, Lamb may very well be the ultimate meat for barbecuing. But of course, having said that, if you're not into lamb, this really would be wonderful on pretty much anything else, including, and you didn't hear this from me, grilled tofu. But regardless of whether you use some rack of lamb or another cut of meat or a curd of bean, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Bulgogi beef. That's right, I'm going to show you my take on what's generally referred to as Korean barbecue. Although many barbecue purists will claim this has nothing to do with real barbecue. But that's okay. The vast majority of people don't really care what barbecue purists think. They're usually more concerned with how good something tastes. And when it comes to this stuff, there is no issue in that department. This really is incredibly delicious. So let's go ahead and get started with the most important component. No, not the beef. The marinade. So in a large mixing bowl, we're going to start with some flavorful vegetation, including some crushed or finely minced garlic, and then a little bit of grated onion. And sure, if you want, I guess you could mince that really fine. But if you use a cheese grater for this, you're going to get more of a liquefied onion, which is really what we want here. Plus, who doesn't enjoy a good cry once in a while? And then speaking of grated, we'll also add some finely grated ginger. I did that on the microplane. We are also going to toss in some toasted sesame oil, as well as a spoon of brown sugar, Okay, so we have our aromatic, nutty, and sweet covered, which brings us to our salty element. So we'll toss in a generous splash of soy sauce and none of that low sodium stuff. We wanna go full sodium here. And then of course, we're definitely gonna want some heat, which we'll do in the form of Korean chili flakes, which goes by the name of, hold on, I wrote this down phonetically, gochugaro, gochugaro. I think that's pretty close, or not. So we'll go ahead and toss in a nice big spoon of Korean chili flakes. And then last but not least, another key ingredient. We are going to peel and grate in about a quarter of this Asian pear. I know it does look like an apple, but it is actually a kind of pear. And not only is that going to provide some additional sweet flavor, but there's actually an enzyme in the fruit that's going to tenderize our meat. So we'll go ahead and grate in a little bit of that. And then we will take our freakishly small wooden spoon and give that a stir because we are pretty much done with the marinade. So we'll stir that together and simply set that aside and go find some meat to slice. This magical marinade works beautifully with chicken, pork, and beef. And today I'm going to show you my personal favorite cut for this, which would be the boneless short rib, which at my butcher at least is sold in these fairly well-trimmed chunks. You might see a little bit of fat and connective tissue here or there, but that's okay. And all we need to do to prep this is slice it up, but not too thin. I like to shoot for something between an eighth and a quarter inch. And by the way, in the blog post, I'm going to cover the two major variables here. How thin you slice your meat, and how long you marinate it for. Okay, by tweaking those two things, you can get a vast array of different textures here. But like I said, I'm gonna go for something about 3 eighths of an inch thick, since that's my personal preference. And as usual, we're gonna slice across the grain if possible. Although, as you may be able to see, I think I did one piece with the grain, but that really didn't seem to cause any major problems. But generally, as a rule, we do wanna slice across the grain. And then once that meat is sliced up, we'll go ahead and transfer it into our marinade and stir it together which you could do with your tongs or a spatula, but I really enjoy using my fingers. This feels surprisingly good, and I'm not at all embarrassed to admit that. It is strangely satisfying. Not to mention your fingers are always gonna do a more thorough job here than any tongs or spatula. So we'll go ahead and give that a mix, 
at which point we want to cover this and pop in the fridge to marinate it. And how long is it going to be up to you? The accepted range would be from one hour to overnight. But I never let mine go that long. I'm a one or two hour guy. And again, I'm going to go into that on the blog. But my preference is to wrap that up and pop it in the fridge for about an hour or two, at which point we're going to pull it out and prep it for the pan. And all that means is we're going to unwrap it and season it up with a little bit of salt. Some people will just add more soy in the beginning, but it's already a very wet marinade. So I do go with a little bit of salt at this point. And then to finish this up, we'll also add a little drizzle of vegetable oil. And we'll give that a quick toss with our tongs. And why not fingers this time? It's a good question. I got kind of tired of washing my hands. And once that's mixed up, we are ready to cook. And for me, the best choice is a smoking hot cast iron skillet that I'll brush with a little bit of oil. And we'll go ahead and transfer in our bulgogi beef into hopefully a single layer. If you're using more than a pound or so of beef, you want to do this in batches. And then what we'll do is cook this for about two or three minutes per side on the highest heat setting possible. And that's going to be it. And of course, that's an incredibly short cooking time for something that usually is braised for hours. But that is the magic of this marinade at work. We're going to get something tender and delicious in like five minutes. So just one of the many reasons I love this recipe. And of course, because this is such a wet marinade, you're probably not going to get a super awesome sear on this. But that's fine. You'll see when we plate up, it's going to be gorgeous. And having said that, you will get some caramelization around the edges. But anyway, to recap, we're going to give that first side a couple minutes. And then we'll flip that meat over. And then we'll go ahead and give that side a couple minutes. And I always know I'm getting close when the moisture in the pan kind of evaporates and it starts to smoke again. And yes, a well-ventilated kitchen with a fan is highly recommended. In fact, at the Korean restaurants where you do this table side, they have a fan right over the table. But anyway, we're going to cook that for about five minutes total, at which point we can turn off our heat and pull that out of the pan and we'll serve that up immediately on some steamed rice, which is being featured in my traditional Korean style plate which by the way is also my Japanese style plate, Chinese style plate, Vietnamese style plate, and I believe also Indian style plate. So as you longtime viewers know, that plate gets around. But anyway, I'm going to pile up a nice generous portion of our beef, and then I'm going to finish up with some sliced green onions, as well as an extra touch of our Korean chili flakes, or as I attempted to pronounce earlier, gochugaro. And then if you want, I could also top with some sesame seeds, but I was out. But of course, that's up to you. You are the young MC of your bulgogi. And speaking of bust to move, one move I didn't bust was to pick up some kimchi at the store, which is pretty much mandatory on this plate. So I tried to Photoshop some in, but you know what, that was just not the same. So I was forced to serve this as is. And yes, I do like to give my guests a choice of chopsticks or a fork. Mostly so my guests using the fork can be shamed by the people using the chopsticks. It's all in good fun. So let me go ahead and grab the aforementioned sticks and go in for a taste. And that really is every bit as incredibly delicious as it looks. I mean, that marinade really is borderline magical. I mean, forget borderline, it's magical. To transform something as tough and chewy as beef short rib with just one hour of marination into something this tender and delicious, I think is pretty impressive. And something else that would be impressive is if I could get the rice and the meat in the same bite. I've really not perfected that move yet, but hey, I'm only 53. There's still plenty of time. Oh, and by the way, not that it needs it, but if you did want to splash a little water in there and deglaze that pan, you could serve this with some of those caramelized drippings. That's usually never a bad thing. To be honest, I usually don't, because it's so flavorful as is. That's actually going to benefit the rice much more than the meat. But anyway, that's it, my take on bulgogi beef, which as I mentioned is just as effective used with chicken or pork or pretty much any other animal we could catch and slice thinly, which really does include a lot of things. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Beer barbecue, beef flank steak. That's right, it's true. Beer makes everything better. It's like the bacon of beverages. And here we're combining the awesomeness of barbecue with the magic of beer to make one of the most delicious grilled beef flank steak recipes I've had in like ever. So check it out, this was so easy and it starts with a very simple Kansas City style barbecue base, which of course includes ketchup, some molasses, and some white vinegar. All right, so we're gonna put those three ingredients in a mixing bowl. That's your holy trinity of classic tomato-based American barbecue sauces. We're also going to add some white sugar, lots of black pepper, freshly and finely ground, of course, a big shake of cayenne, some salt, some cumin, some allspice, 
and some cinnamon. All right, and then we're going to take a whisk and we're going to mix that up. And that's all we need as far as a barbecue sauce base. And of course, you can just substitute what I just did with your favorite prepared barbecue sauce. But you saw how easy that was, so why not just make your own? All right, so so far we have barbecue sauce. But of course, to make it beer barbecue sauce, we're going to add a cup of beer. And I'm just using a Belgian ale, but I'm pretty sure anything's going to work. Although I would lean towards the more intense, fuller flavored beers, as opposed to that watery stuff in the cans that people seem to love to drink in commercials. All right, so use a real beer that tastes like beer. Because I really think it's that subtle bitterness in the background that really makes this beer barbecue sauce pop. All right, so we're going to mix that in, and that is ready. And not only is that going to act as our sauce, it's also going to act as our marinade and our basting liquid. All right, so first up, of course, we're going to use it as a marinade on this, a fully trimmed one and a half pound flank steak. So I'm going to place it in a casserole dish. I'm going to pour over our sauce. And then we're going to grab two forks, and we're going to start poking this. Now here I'm lifting it up just to get some sauce underneath. Why didn't I pour some sauce in there first? That would have been too easy. And then I want you to take your two forks and poke and poke and poke. I'm going to say at least 100 pokes per side. So I want you to fork one side for a few minutes. I want you to flip it over. And I want you to continue poking with the fork. Like every half inch, just keep poking, poking. And then thanks to what I believe is capillary action, that incredible sauce is going to get down into that meat. And it's really going to absorb that flavor from the inside out. All right? So you can't really poke it too much. But eventually you'll get tired of poking it and you'll be like, this is forking ridiculous. And at that point, it probably is time to stop. So again, a couple minutes of poking per side. And at that point, I want you to cover this with plastic wrap and marinate this for at least eight hours. So you can do this at night and cook it the next day or do it early in the morning for cooking out later that evening. But I'm going to go ahead and suggest that eight to 12 hours would be ideal. At that point, we're going to remove the plastic. We're going to remove the flank steak from the sauce. And I'm going to use paper towels to pat that fairly dry. All right, wet meat really doesn't grill well. So you do not want a lot of excess marinade on that piece of meat. So I'm going to blot off as much as I can. And then, of course, do not discard that beer barbecue sauce. We're going to pour that into a small saucepan. We're going to bring that up to a simmer. And I want you to simmer that on medium for about five minutes. And what was technically a marinade or brine has now turned into a basting sauce. So I'm going to turn off the heat. I'm going to grab some kind of pastry brush or mop. And that is ready to go. All right, last step before we head out to the grill, let's go ahead and re-season the meat. And trust me, the inside of that meat is very flavorful, but I do want a little bit of salt and pepper on the outside. All right, so I did season both sides fairly generously. At that point, we're going to head outside to the grill where I have a beautifully hot and mature charcoal fire. We're going to put our beef down. Now this is going to take approximately five minutes per side, give or take. So what I like to do is two and a half minutes like that. I'll give it the old half turn so we get those awesome diamond grill marks. I'll go about two, two and a half minutes like that. At that point, we will flip it over and we'll give the other side about five minutes. And while we're waiting, we'll go ahead and paint our barbecue sauce on the top. And there are very few things in life as beautiful as a glistening, smoky flank steak on the grill being painted with beer barbecue sauce. I mean, if it's not the most beautiful thing, it's like in the top five for sure. And now here's the deal. The other side is now cooked for about four minutes, and this should be getting close. Of course, you're going to verify with a thermometer if you need to. All right, I shoot for about 125 in the thickest part, and I'll explain why later. So at that point, we're going to flip it over and paint this side with barbecue sauce. But keep in mind, the other side has sauce on it, and that sauce is sweet, and it will burn if you leave it down too long. So at this point, we're just glazing. Like I said, this is pretty much all the way cooked. So what I'll do is I'll leave that down for about 30 seconds. I'll paint it on this side. I'll flip it over, give that side about 30 seconds while I glaze this side again. And by then it should be done and perfect. So bottom line, you're not glazing with that sauce until the last couple minutes of cooking. And when the thickest part of the meat is about 125, I'm going to pull it off the grill. I'm going to let it rest for at least five or 10 minutes. And then we're going to slice. And I like to cut it down the center first. Divide and conquer. So slice it lengthwise and then cut it across against the grain. And you want to go pretty much straight down. And as I'm cutting this, you can see the reason I like the thickest part to be about 120, 125, because it tapers. So those thinner parts are going to be medium well, medium. And as it gets towards the thicker part, you'll get into the medium rares. And then at the very thickest parts, you'll almost have something that's on the rare side. So a flank steak is great for a crowd. There's going to be something for everybody. 
and you can see how gorgeous and juicy that meat is. And I can't resist any longer. I got to taste some. And of course, what was a marinade and then a basting sauce is now a finishing sauce. So I'm going to drizzle on a little beer barbecue sauce. And I really don't know what it was about that beer, but it just gave this such an interesting and awesome flavor. So I sliced that up. I threw it on a plate. I'm going to eat mine with an apricot and kale salad because I'm health conscious. And there you go. Beer barbecue beef flank steak. I know it sounds like a Freudian slip, but it's not. It is an incredibly delicious technique. I mean, it really was a familiar barbecue-y type flavor, but there was something just way more complex and interesting. I was just absolutely thrilled with how this came out. I thought it was fantastic. And as far as tender goes, if you can cut flank steak with a fork, you know you did something right, okay? So I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.